Have you ever seen that commercial where the dad reads his kid a bedtime story about how all the food in Las Vegas is made of broccoli? They've got broccoli smoothies and broccoli pancakes, broccoli ice cream, he tells his son, who listens absolutely horrified. And of course, they have raw, unseasoned broccoli with stems. Now look, I get why broccoli's the butt of the joke. If you wanna talk your kids out of coming on vacation with you, all you have to do is tell them that the place is full of green vegetables. But you know what? Broccoli deserves better than that. It can be great, snack-worthy even. You just gotta know how to treat it right. Broccoli is a member of one very special plant species, Brassica oleracea. A long time ago, humans started cultivating a wild cabbage plant and selectively picking the traits they wanted. This slow process resulted in a species that includes everything from cauliflower and Brussels sprouts to kale and collard greens, and of course, broccoli. Actually, many, many more. This directly mirrors what happened with another very special species, Canis familiaris better known as dogs. Just as these brassicas all came from wild cabbage, all dogs are descendants of wolves. Now in both cases, artificial selection has led to a massive variety within the species. Kale, which looks exactly like a Portuguese water dog, was created by selecting for leaves. Broccoli was created by selecting for flowers and stems, and it's obviously a poodle. I mean, come on, look at it. Check out my kale video, which is linked below, to learn what brassica is clearly a bulldog. A fun fact about those broccoli flowers is that the tiny, tightly packed buds that make up broccoli crowns inspired the name broccoli, an Italian word that means the flowering crest of cabbage. Man, that's beautiful. I wish Dan meant the flowering crest of cabbage. Another fun fact is that if you leave broccoli in the ground to keep growing, those flowers will open up into a zillion little yellow blooms. Broccoli stands out from some of its brassica brethren because it contains two very different parts. The crown, which is made up of all those tiny flowers, and a big edible stem. Now, if you were anything like me as a kid, the only way you really got excited about eating broccoli was when you pretended to be, say, I don't know, a massive brachiosaurus munching off the tops of the broccoli trees on your plate. That was good clean fun. But did I continue eating the tree all the way down the trunk? I certainly did not. Even as a young man, I dodged broccoli stems and paid a premium for crowns. Now before you judge, I know a lot of you do that too, because in many markets, broccoli crowns are way easier to find than whole broccoli. But I've changed, which means you can too. And that's why I've gathered you all here today to tell you to buy whole broccoli. A, it's cheaper, and B, the stem is incredibly delicious if you know how to handle it. Let's go to the kitchen and learn how to be a professional broccoli butcher. Okay, so I start by laying the broccoli down on the cutting board and I cut crosswise from crown to the end of the stem like this. I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Did that make anyone else absolutely shudder? Yeah, yeah. We're like the same person. Now in my humble opinion, one of the finest ways to enjoy broccoli is roasting because it brings out a whole new level of flavor and texture. Flavor and texture my parents never told me about. That's right, Gen Z. We only ever ate steamed broccoli. Please, no. So, we're gonna prep our broccoli with roasting in mind. Now, if you saw my asparagus video, you heard me talk about peeling away the spear's protective waxy cuticle. Broccoli stem has that same kind of tough outer layer, which doesn't turn tender the way the interior does. I find it gets particularly tough when roasted, so we gotta get rid of it. I hold the crown in my left hand and then use my vegetable peeler to peel all around the circumference of the stem. Any little bits of lighter green won't tenderize. As a side benefit, peeling actually helps with flavor as well. Peeling activates the enzymatic reaction that converts sulforaphane into flavorful isothiocyanates. While I've got my peeler out and I've got that peeling feeling as they say, let's do a quick sidebar on peeling. I find that people either love these Y peelers or they can't stand them. And I think for the people that can't stand them, some of it comes down to how they hold the peeler. There are actually three different ways to grip and use a Y peeler, and that depends on the produce you're working with. To peel wide swaths of skin on something substantial like butternut squash, hold the peeler like this with your thumb and index finger on opposite sides. This gives you good power to work through tougher skins and peels. When peeling round vegetables and fruits like this apple, wrap your hand around the handle and place your thumb on the produce like this. This hold provides tons of control so that you can easily follow the natural curvature of the fruit. Finally, when peeling things like asparagus and carrots, where you want to take off thin, delicate strips without too much of the flesh below, pinch the handle between your thumb and forefinger like this, and make movements with your wrist. You can work very quickly without removing too much material. For broccoli stems, I use the first method, because the outer skin is tough, and there are undulations that require some serious force to get through. Now, we'll just separate the stem from the crown and break it down into half-inch thick pieces about two to three inches in length. Beautiful. At this point, we need to separate the crown into smaller florets. Florets are cute, like little baby broccoli trees. They're adorable, but their round shape isn't great for browning. 
For that, we need flat sides that make good contact with the sheet pan. Check out this experiment. I have two pieces of broccoli that I roasted on the same sheet in the same 400 degree oven for the same amount of time. This one has a wide flat side, while this one is a cute little round florette. And just look at the massive difference in browning. That flat side is deeply brown. Compare that to this piece of broccoli, which picked up just a tiny bit of browning where it contacted the sheet. That difference is surface area, and you want lots of it. More surface area equals more browning, which equals more flavor. Slicing through the florets like this to create wedges that sit flush with the cooking surface and brown deeply makes a lot of sense. But it also leads to my arch nemesis, broccoli dust. Just look at the mess left on my cutting board. Now check this out. Instead of slicing all the way through the florets, I make my cuts through just the light green parts of the stem. Then once I've made those cuts, I pick up the broccoli and simply pull it apart. This way, the florets separate at natural seams. Not only is there no broccoli dust to deal with, but each section looks pretty and natural. So nice. Now roasting vegetables generally goes something like this. Oil a baking sheet, place the cut up vegetables on that sheet, transfer it to a very hot oven, usually in the range of 400 to 500 degrees, and roast until the veggies are tender and well browned. That's a solid approach, but there are a couple of tweaks we can make so that our broccoli browns exceptionally well. First, we pop our baking sheet in the oven and preheat it to 500 degrees. Think of it like preheating a skillet before adding food. Then, instead of oiling the baking sheet, we'll add it directly to the broccoli. This targeted approach means we don't have pools of oil on the baking sheet that overheat and smoke in the oven. After adding the oil, we toss the broccoli with a little salt and pepper and a dash of sugar. Now this is a tiny amount, so it's not enough to make the broccoli taste sweet. It just helps it brown a little more rapidly so that we get a beautiful bronze color before the interior overcooks. Not that good at that. Look at this gorgeous platter of broccoli. I could eat this tray by myself just like this, but that doesn't mean I don't want to cover it with flavorful toppings that would make even potato chips jealous. Check out these tasty seasoning combos that deputy food editor Andrea Geary dreamed up. They add flavor and texture without sogging out the broccoli and undoing all of that good crisping work we did. Parmesan and black pepper is like cacio e pepe meets broccoli. Toasted sesame seeds and orange zest, which is Andrea's take on gomasio, the ubiquitous Japanese sesame salt. And the Cook's Illustrated staff favorite, this smoky sunflower seed business that's like a ballpark snack you'll want to sprinkle on everything. These are so good. I'll admit, I went pretty nerdy on broccoli today, but you know what? I think it was worth it. Because this is definitely how to eat broccoli. Are you also just now realizing that your parents tricked you out of a vacation by telling you that all the food there would be broccoli? What a scam. If you'd gone on that Vegas trip, you'd be so rich right now. Either way, check out the links below to our favorite broccoli recipes and all of those great toppings. Thanks to Deputy Food Editor Andrew Geary for those. Don't forget to hit that like button and be sure to subscribe to the show for more episodes. Oh, and I'd love to hear some of your suggestions in the comments about topics you want me to cover next. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.